sorts of tea about what's going on inside Washington, D.C., what regulators and lawmakers are thinking and about and working on, and what you and your credit union should be considering in terms of risk areas and areas of opportunity. My name is Ann Petros. I'm NAFQ's Vice President of Regulatory Affairs. And today I am pleased to be joined by Kathy Craninger, former Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and now Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Salidas Labs, where she works to advance market integrity and responsible innovation in digital assets markets. So welcome, Kathy. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, you know, we'll be discussing the underlying technology behind digital assets like cryptocurrency. So that's blockchain. Um, many you know people think this technology holds a lot of promise for the financial services industry. So I'd like to dig into that premise a little bit with you. Well, it's fantastic, and to be with you, and great to be talking to a credit union audience again. Uh, it's been a little while. This is not my typical audience, as you can imagine now in the digital asset space, but yeah. but fantastic to talk to you because it is an evolving area and of great interest, uh, basically going to touch every sector of the economy and certainly every part of the financial services industry. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And and a lot of NAFQ's credit union members have questions about digital assets as you know their, their members are looking into all types of digital assets and, and asking questions of their institutions. So um, on a really basic level, let's just break down blockchain. Um, you know, what is it and what are some applications outside of cryptocurrency? Because you know everyone knows what Bitcoin is or Ethereum or Litecoin. Um, but you know, for example, are there some ways that that blockchain can simplify um, the the offering of financial products and services? You know, for example, like know your customer requirements. So it is truly an exciting technology that has so many different applications and use cases. Frankly, that are even beyond my comprehension today, as as someone who uh, probably doesn't have quite the vision that that others have had. But but the way I like to think about blockchain technology is that it is the future infrastructure of of the internet. Mm -hmm. So if you think back, for those of us that are that, that were there uh, then in the early '90s and late '80s, when you got your first email account and you just thought it was super cool to actually be able to, you know, send a message across the globe and have it get there simultaneously, you know, we were not envisioning. I'll speak for myself, maybe and many, but envisioning what ended up happening with e-commerce and social media and phones in our pockets that actually could connect us to mm -hmm. you know anything to buy instantaneously and have delivered. So this whole uh, arena of where we are today with the internet, blockchain is really the next iteration of that. And the, the key thing about it is that it's ledger technology. So it is about actually being able to prove ownership and, and creative ownership and license over it, you know, just about anything. So people are certainly creating their own art in the form mm -hmm. of NFTs, and, and that's the way people think about it. But it really is about being able to, to uh, share, distribute, demonstrate ownership over anything and, and really put uh, contract terms around that sharing as well. How can it be used? And that's all... Uh, automated. It's all embedded in mm -hmm. the blockchain technology. So there are many use cases that are coming that we haven't thought of, but there's a few that I think are, are pretty interesting, just to one uh, in particular, just to demonstrate it too. You know, it's also about getting what are more limited resources and, and in a distributed fashion, managing that such that you actually get the benefit of excess capacity. So I like to think of it as you know the, the load bearing on the electric grid. It is a, a constant balancing act. Where is there actual excess capacity? Where can you mm -hmm. sell? How do you bring it in? Uh, there is a company now that is actually building that for uh, data warehousing. So think about information like about humans rights violations evidence photographs videos being taken you know in ukraine in different parts of africa in parts of the middle east where right, you've got right. authoritarian regimes in place you know the ability to actually gather that evidence save it and store it across uh, data warehouses stores cloud uh, mm -hmm. capacity across the globe 
where no one person controls access to that information. No one person mm -hmm. can actually eliminate or destroy that yeah, information. Yeah, it's immutable. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity for that to be available to humanity, you know, that is exactly one example of this that, that people are thinking about and working on and that, that exists today is making that available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, um, you know, sort of decentralized structure where it's it's entire networks of you know computers obviously that have to validate you know each new block that's added to the chain or every you know new bit of information that is stored on this so um there you know are certainly a lot of of different applications you mentioned art you know so um the the potential for i guess faster you know royalty payments and and in the um area of ip um, protection, I think, could be very interesting indeed. Yes, but, and and bringing mm -hmm. it closer to field too. I mean, loyalty programs. There are a lot of uh, you know payment companies, financial services companies, and and commerce looking at that too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ways to actually benefit people. Um, you know, concert tickets, all of those things, yeah. anything that's a collectible, but also an access point. Right. So lots, lots of opportunities there yeah. too. Yeah. And with, you know, know your customer requirements, as soon as you have that information uh, input in the, in the blockchain somewhere and, you know, one institution validates it, the next doesn't have to. So it's just there as, as a, uh, as a fact, right. Of who, you know, owns uh, a corporation. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. on the KYC point too, lots of opportunity for people to own their own information and share, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, the validation. Um, the, the good examples here are just age, proof of age. You know, if you want to buy a drink, uh, you want to get into a bar, you've got to be 21. Uh, but oh no, the, those fake IDs yes, are yes, long gone. <laughs> yes. Challenge is there, but at least to, to prove that you are 21, that's the only, uh, over 21, right. I should say, that's all you have to show. No one needs to know your birthday. No one yeah. needs to actually even know your name. Uh, they just need that validation confirmation that you're in fact eligible mm -hmm. for entry. And so lots of other opportunities around identity management so that you're really only sharing what needs to be shared. The absolutely pertinent information. So that aspect of anonymity is is sort of interesting here as well. Now, do you think that you know lawmakers and regulators should be paying closer attention? Um, you mentioned, you know, the the contracts that that sort of underlie these um, transactions, and that would be smart contracts, right? That rely on this blockchain. So. Should lawmakers and regulators be paying attention to to smart contracts? And you know, for example, in instances like for the purchase of an automobile or real estate, um, you know, especially I've been reading a lot about you know fractionalized real estate ownership or, or tokenized real estate. No, I, well, I will say regulators definitely are paying attention to this space and learning more and more about it every day, which. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there are new benefits here and opportunities and there, and there are risks. And so you've got to actually balance and understand those. But while we're still talking about opportunities, there is a lot of exciting, uh, I think, applications here for real estate um, and, and you get to fractionalized ownership, but the opportunity to even invest in different mm -hmm. segments of, of the economy and, and help people where You've got challenges in affordability, costs of, of housing is, right. is of course, uh, greatly increasing. So the opportunity to perhaps create a, a, a fund uh, and enable people to trade, you know, the, the um, uh, assets that they actually own in that fund or, or decide that they're going to have a mix of housing stock in different parts of the country, um, putting that into a marketplace through blockchain is actually a much uh, more efficient way of managing those uh, investments and mm -hmm. and being able to trade those investments. You could see future, you know, home equity lines, um, the ability for those uh, homeowners to to try to get again new investment into their house or otherwise they could go to this as a liquidity pool. And so the market mechanisms mm. that are inherent in the blockchain really helping. Uh, get that additional liquidity in a way that, again, get access to, to multiple investors that want to have part of that or available. Um, so you can see the role for for banks and financial institutions with the responsible you know, controls around that to open up the new investment opportunities in that fractionalized ownership. Um, and, and we had 
lots of challenges, obviously, with the financial crisis around managing uh, titles and and understanding, you know, who actually owned the paper. Again, all of these uh, basically just ledgers, having them be distributed, having them be uh, on the blockchain is a, a much uh, easier way to see and demonstrate in a transparent way. Everybody can see who owns what, where it's where it's sitting now in terms of that asset's ownership. So mm -hmm. also, again, an exciting uh, opportunity. Yeah, the transparency is is definitely exciting, and you know, access to credit, especially for um, you know individuals that that otherwise may not have you know a, a, as easy an opportunity to um, invest. You know, small time investors could be really great. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we'll have to see how all that plays out. Um, you know, but speaking of regulation, some lawmakers have been very um, up in arms about the recent FTX scandal. So, you know, what level of regulation do you think is appropriate in the digital assets space? And, you know, what are some potential benefits and, and risks of, of regulation? I mean, what might that mean for markets? No, oh, it, it is a challenge to get regulation right. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it because there are, you know, you, you've got to take that step back and look at things holistically. You have different agencies with different authorities too. So of course they're going to be looking at their own lane. Um, and the opportunity to look holistically is, is I think, a, um, you know, it's a, it's a challenging perspective. That's why I, I was very positive about the president's executive order. Again, really taking that step back, looking holistically at different agencies, their authorities, their roles and responsibilities, and the, the kind of macro goals that the government should have vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis its engagement with blockchain technology and its regulation of it. So interests of national security, interests of US competitiveness in, in a global marketplace, Consumer protection, um, you know, there there are a lot of different dimensions to to continue to promote in this, you know, innovation, uh, workforce dimensions. Um, so it it really did lay out the kind of those those high level goals, and then pushing all of the agencies to be part of a cohesive process to put together the reports and outline you know benefits and risks. Sometimes those reports, I mean, I was involved in writing them and, and in writing the executive orders that required them. So sometimes those reports are, are you know, just a paper exercise. But mm -hmm. a lot of times it's really a thoughtful opportunity to try to drive consensus and solutions and give industry the opportunity and, and really all stakeholders. Traditional finance has a big role in coming in and talking about this and looking at it. Consumer advocates clearly do too. Uh, so really coming together holistically and trying to balance some of the interests and, and look at the opportunities. So that's that's certainly one thing that uh, puts a, a you know, a broader framing around mm -hmm. this so so that we can think about it from from a country, you know, the country's perspective. When you think about though, um, what should the regulation look like? The um, it it is it is definitely challenged because we have uh, a current regime, largely money transmitter businesses. Those are the types of licenses that the players in the digital asset space are getting regulated at the state level. The market conduct is is often not you know it's not part of that regime in in most states. So you have different dimensions to bring to bear when you're actually talking about um, market activity. Uh, and so that's the, the gap that Congress has looked at mm -hmm. um, most specifically is who has spot market oversight for digital asset markets, particularly if they're not designated as securities and, and a big debate in can right, of worms around what is, commodities, yeah, yeah. What, what is a security, <laughs> what is a commodity, what, you know, mm -hmm. what, what are these assets exactly? Right. But that's been a gap filler that some countries have gotten around by just saying, you know, what is typically the case. Industry needs to actually assess that. There are obviously the Howey test assess uh, one way to assess whether something's a security. And so industry needs to actually figure that out. Company comes forward and, and looks at the regime and decides what they are. But the good thing about a spot market um, regime and oversight for digital assets is that there's a, there's a gap filler there. They said countries across the globe have done it. Uh, they, they know what a security is, but they've said, hey, you've decided you're not a security. You still actually mm -hmm. have to implement these types of market protections. I think the other thing that's important to note with the FTX event too 
you know, fraud is illegal. Um, and, and you right. absolutely have to be truthful and, and disclose to your customers what you're going to do with their assets and, and you're held to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot to investigate uh, on that particular place, but, but there are laws in place today that, that protect uh, consumers and further clarity around expectations of custody and further clarity around, um, you know, particularly the, the assets that help drive the ecosystem, like stable coins, uh, what reserves entities might uh, need to have, or at least disclosure of those reserves. All of those things are, are important uh, to really furthering the ecosystem. And unfortunately, we have a trust gap again that we need to really, uh, as an industry, build back from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's certainly a lot of uh, open questions to resolve. I mean, what do you think about um, when it comes to consumer protection and digital assets? Yeah, the the disclosure is the basis of so much consumer protection, mm-hmm. and and uh, you'll recall too that we had a, a disclosure sandbox that we tried at the CFPB to to really push to get people to think about that. Because I think writ large, we have some challenges. Um, when people don't actually read what's being put in front of them, it's mm-hmm. hard to say that the consumers understand the product they're engaging with. And when you talk about technology dynamics too, you know, uh, m- many people gloss over <laughs> when it sure. comes to technology. So, yeah. so really conveying the information that the consumer needs to know in a way that they're actually going to interact with it. I think there are so many opportunities with, with this technology and in general, when you think about smartphones and, and that kind of just in time piece of information. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would love to see more work around um, better disclosure. Uh, I know that traditional financial players and, and the credit unions, frankly, are, are more innovative probably than some of the others who have invested <laughs> in the longstanding approaches they've had to disclosure and know what the requirements are. But, but I think for fintech companies and digital asset companies, an opportunity is, is absolutely here to mm-hmm. change that. And consumers' expectations have changed. You've got younger consumers that are just like, you know, looking at some of these things, thinking this is antiquated right. and bureaucratic right. and ridiculous. Um, so that's that's one area that that I think is important. Um, the fundamental thing, though, is that we also have an expectation from consumers with their experience with with banks, at least those that are accessing and using the banking system today and haven't um, been left behind. They expect that their deposits are insured. That's what we have taught them is the case. Right. And so this yeah. notion clearly of, this is a different situation. Yeah, yes. Notion of insurance <laughs> mm-hmm. or notion of of um, you know, the risks of investment writ large. What is what is an right. investment and what actually is, you yeah. know, your assets, what do you own? What have you actually put mm-hmm. in? Um, I think that needs much better um, definition and explanation. Uh, so that's one thing that we have done at Solidus with so many other players who are responsible market participants. Mm-hmm. We created a crypto market integrity coalition. And one of the goals is to create that line. Mm-hmm. Um, I think right now everyone thinks of digital assets as one big blanket area. Just like traditional finance, there are more and less speculative activities that can happen. And it's mm-hmm. really about creating that line and making sure they understand the, the products they're engaging with and right. and whether they're they're taking more risk uh, on or or whether they're in a safer investment. Well, and especially to to be able to have those disclosures at your fingertips, right on your cell phone, where you may be, you know, making those purchases or transactions. Um, you know, having something that is modernized and and formatted for a cell phone screen <laughs> and, and is easy to read. Um, you know, I, I know that that NAFQ has has raised that issue with with some existing disclosures required from the the CFPB, just making them mobile friendly and and um, you know bringing it into the 21st century, so to speak. <laughs> um, but you know, as we think about cryptocurrency gaining, you know, wider acceptance and and use among especially you know younger consumers um, and. Potentially, it's it's broader application in in retail markets. Uh, you know, there's a potential to to streamline payments, uh, facilitate you know cheaper and faster um, and more secure peer to peer payments, and and so um, questions come up about you know fraud and and what does that look like within 
cryptocurrency. I mean, obviously, you know, blockchain carries with it um, a higher level of security just innately by its design. But but what are some of the the fraud risks? Are there any fraud risks? Uh -huh. Uh, there, <laughs> un, unfortunately, there are. Uh, where the uh, motivation to make money and, and fast money uh, exists, people are going to find a way. And and certainly there there have always been as technology has evolved, and be, uh, you know scammers, fraudsters taking advantage of that mm -hmm. change. You know, so we have the same you know the same types of low level fraud that. Mm -hmm that have existed with us since we've had the telephone and, and you've got yeah. uh, particularly more vulnerable populations, you know, older Americans. Um, uh, that is that is definitely still uh, an area to be conscious of as, as um, you know, they're, they're not fully understanding some of the mm -hmm. technology gains and, and you've got the same kinds of uh, phishing attacks that can happen uh, right. in, uh, through, you know, social means trying to uh, get hold of people's keys, get hold of people's so access. Social engineering. Social yeah, engineering yeah. driven mm -hmm. to, 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 you know, so, so the same types of things that exist in email or on phone or otherwise mm -hmm. uh, exist in crypto to try to get access to people's assets and, sure. and confuse them. Um, and, and you have... Um, I mean, obviously, so, the FTX scandal is is, it's is different. separate and apart. So <laughs> yes, it's different. It's different. <laughs> just focusing, focusing on the the consumer risk and yes. and not you know that uh, corporate level fraud. Yes, though, uh, excellent point to distinguish those things <laughs> um, because they they are definitely different. Mm -hmm. But but again, a lot of the entry level type things, as I was right. talking about, phishing, um, even uh, impersonations. So. Again, look, not everyone is actually reading the smart contract of the tokens that they're buying right. or investing in. Uh, and so there are capabilities out there like one that uh, we actually own at Solidus Labs called tokensniffer.com. So it's actually oh. a consumer application that lets uh, individuals just plug in a wallet address, plug in a smart contract address and say, is this a scam? Because the scams are myriad. Um, we, we've done some research. We've got a, a full report that'll be available online uh, by the time this is aired. Uh, that talks about this exactly. So what people can do to at least be aware, protect themselves. But people, you know, issuing a token scam that precludes you from actually withdrawing your funds or selling that token oh. after you have bought it and deposited it. And, you know, it is there in the code, but if people aren't actually reading it or paying attention, uh, mm -hmm. then you also have impersonations because you can name it whatever you want when you release that tech, that that software that smart contract. So calling it ETH, E-T-H, even though it's not actually Ethereum and people, you know, seeing that right off the bat think they're that buying That can be Ethereum, very confusing. It can be very mm -hmm. confusing. So, you know, again, the, those scam artists are looking for any way to trick you and, right. and, and steal your funds. We as an, as an ecosystem and as a responsible industry need to clean that stuff up. And there are actually opportunities in the blockchain to do that. You know, once, once we've identified a scam contract, the applications and, and platforms could actually preclude you from accessing, just using their user interface, those scam tokens. So that's, that's actually one avenue. If you're interacting directly with the blockchain and directly with the smart contract, you know, that, that doesn't help you. Uh, but as I said, tokensniffer.com, other ways to actually look at what's happening mm -hmm. uh, and not falling for the classic, you know, uh, fear of missing out uh, pump and dump scams, right. which which are definitely there um, as they are in, in, in real life, too. Mm -hmm. Well, that definitely sounds like an excellent resource because I can imagine it being sort of difficult to to really understand, you know, the intricacies of, of the code if <laughs> you're a novice yes. and, and just entering the this space for the first time. Um, so, you know, that has got me thinking about an issue that has come up, you know, recently with the CFPB actually related to, to fraud and, and error resolution responsibilities and, um, you know, whether financial institutions should be uh, the ones that are primarily responsible for reimbursing individuals um, in, in cases of of fraud where someone is impersonating, uh, you know, their financial institution or, you know, someone that they know, um, in, in the case of a legitimate transaction. So specifically in an instance where let's say you, you have a, a stable coin transaction and, 
kind of hypothesizing into the future um, if financial institutions were to be issuers of of stable coins and um, you know how how does fraud and, and error resolution work in that sort of environment is everything virtually the same as it is now and 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 you know how do we adjust our current regulatory and, and legal schematic to account for new players. I mean, we focused on fintech, right? So uh, there's a lot of questions there. <laughs> oh, there, are, there are so many questions there. I mean, I, you do get to a, a new frontier and yes, fat fingering in the wrong phone number mm -hmm. or the wrong email address and that money is gone. And again, what, you know, expectation should you have that your financial institution, you know, cover you for that? Right. And um, so it, it is one area where we've definitely been looking at the opportunities for insurance in this space. I mean, it is, um, and, and it, you fall back on again, the same tried and true, uh, disclosure requirements. Yes, they're not, um, uh, they're not foolproof by any stretch of the imagination. And, uh, but, but that is, um, you know, really people understanding what, what they're responsible for, what the risks are and, and then what backup the institution will provide. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as these uh, services become, uh, you know, much more broadly available and accepted, then you will have, obviously, those responsibilities that likely will be, you know, required in, in law uh, for providing some amount of, um, you know, cer certainly error resolution uh, to the satisfaction of, of the, the consumer or at least of your legal requirement. So you're, you're certainly reminding me of the dimensions of the CFPB complaints database and mm -hmm. a lot of the conversations that we had about that. You know, what, what bounds are there in terms of actually making that consumer whole? Well, it, it depends on all kinds of things in terms of what the actual incident is. And so there is uh, certainly some that's incumbent on the consumer when it is fraud, the opportunity to actually go after those bad actors and continue to try to root them out. And as I said, with blockchain, there there is actually the ability to um, really uh, mitigate those scams too, which I, I didn't get into a minute ago, but make them less profitable for the scammers. So if, for example, you're instituting those smart contract scams over and over and over again, letting people deposit, pumping that in social media, not mm -hmm. letting them withdraw. And then you engage in that rug pull. You pull all of the funds right out from underneath them. Um, if you can't get that value out of the crypto ecosystem, then what is your incentive for even engaging in the scam to begin with? Mm. So working with platforms, actually stopping those scammers from actually getting any money out of the system you know that will that will eliminate the incentive, and so right. there are some real opportunities as opposed to a lot of the things that happen today in real life. So I said that money's gone. Um, now it's just a matter of whether the uh, credit card company or the bank is just going to eat that loss, or how mm -hmm. much of that loss they have to eat, uh, and then we all pay for that. You know, we all pay for that in the cost of the financial system in general. So there's an opportunity here too to use the technology to eliminate uh, at least some of the most basic and, and uh, consumer uh, harming, um, on an individual level, consumer harming uh, scams. Sure. It does seem like Congress needs to step in here, though, <laughs> to resolve some of these uh, unanswered questions. I mean, you know, just the Electronic Fund Transfer Act, I mean, hasn't been amended in, in quite some time now, really doesn't account for, um, you know, payment systems as they currently exist, much less the, the future of, uh, you know, digital assets transactions. So, um, <clears throat> you know, some credit unions have recently received questions from their members about whether it's permissible to, you know, purchase real estate using cryptocurrency. And we touched on that a little bit earlier in terms of, you know, fractionalized um, real estate purchases. But what are some, you know, potential consumer protection concerns there, Bank Secrecy Act concerns um, that that could arise as, as these sorts of transactions become more commonplace and more acceptable and, and a framework is, is set up for facilitating them. Yeah, certainly the, the 
one of the larger challenges is the volatility right now of the assets in the digital asset space. Uh, I, you know, you look at the trajectory of Bitcoin over its existence now, ten years. And it, it still uh, is is it's pretty above. Shocking. Yes, it's, <laughs> it's above the markets. And yes, you have the downs and you have the backups again. But it, it's actually, you know, in in that kind of a time frame, you know, it is uh, impressive in terms of uh, comparing that to traditional markets, and and is still uh, definitely in a positive direction. But day to day, you know, you talk about the timing of that transaction and the value of that asset at the time the transaction mm -hmm. occurs. Um, and so there is still that challenge uh, in terms of how you manage that. And, and so that's one of the dimensions of consumer harm that you see is you're talking about um, something like how important your house is if you're going to live in it uh, or supporting someone's purchase of a, of a house with assets like this. And, and, and then you look at the other side of that from the financial institution standpoint. Now, again, they're going to accept that asset, but what does that asset look like in terms of that value over uh, over the long run? Uh, you know, again, if we're talking about uh, certain assets, you'd think that would be good, but but we really don't know. Right, um, right. So, what is what is the you know loan to value ratio in terms of a down payment on on an asset, and um, you know, even more broadly, if if someone is is claiming all of these you know crypto assets as as part of their you know, net worth, right, in their income stream. I mean, how do you how do you accurately evaluate that? Yes, and and I will say that's that's where I see the biggest challenge in the near term mm -hmm. is is definitely that issue, but it's not unheard of. I mean, you have commodities certainly that that fluctuate over time, and and that people sure. are are using that as the basis of their wealth to to, to engage uh, in uh, financial transactions, and so. I think there there are some parallels that we can draw as we think about these things, but uh, but the challenges of as I think the evaluation is is really the the nearer term issue to some of the more consumer common transactions that you would engage in and maybe right. want to be using these assets mm -hmm. for. Um, but why are people even talking about it? Because there is actually a benefit in terms of the blockchain dimension and fractionalization, as we said. So I think there, the, over time, we will work through these things. There, in fact, have been, uh, I think, and you and I talked about them, there have been assets. Uh, I, there have been ha homes bought, for example, mm -hmm. with, with digital assets. Um, it's not something I would have done or advised. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I also don't, you know, I don't have that much in terms of my digital asset portfolio. Yeah. But uh, but I think the future is is definitely there as an opportunity, and particularly as you think about stable coins that are uh, in fact regulated, that have clear reserves behind them. Right. As you think about the the way that people can engage, you know, with other tokens that are really for different use cases. But I think right now there are only a couple of of tokens that have the liquidity that would be necessary, frankly, to to really start thinking about these mm -hmm. issues and trusting them. Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, uh, USDC, and some of the stable coins, but but their purpose is a little different than this. So uh, we're we're um, I think in an exciting um, place in terms of thinking about it. And then yes, at the federal level, um, I, I the way I see the agencies now, I can't see many of them actually entertaining this, but but I think over time they will, and and they mm -hmm. should, and and. Consumers are going to be pushing that. Individual uh, consumers, just like they're pushing their institutions, to be supporting uh, their ability to custody and interact with these assets. Absolutely right. We've we've had conversations with the NCUA about you know, questions surrounding you know custody of, of digital assets and and what that could look like for the credit union industry. Um, not that the industry is necessarily ready for something like that but these these questions are coming up and and they're important questions to uh to tackle and and start thinking about you know regulatory path forward mm -hmm. um but it looks like lawmakers are, are probably most comfortable with something like a stable coin and so that that may be the first piece of legislation that we we see here um any other you know blockchain news or um crypto related news that you want our viewers and listeners to be aware of kind of what's what's the latest and greatest in in this market Yes, uh, I don't know about the latest and greatest, <laughs> but I do think there is an area that that uh, we haven't directly touched on in this mm -hmm. conversation that is probably the nearest term, uh, and frankly, is the current use case for 
uh, blockchain technology and, and cryptocurrencies and stable coins. And, and that's cross-border payments and remittances. Yes. As you talk about the opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer transfer of value across borders, that is a, a very friction-filled process today. Very expensive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Expensive, a number of intermediaries involved, right. a, a lot of dimensions to that. And when you look at the opportunity to do that, um, you know, again, across borders or in the developing world, it's a place where I see great opportunity for leapfrogging, in fact. Mm -hmm. And that's something that that U.S. industry should be a little concerned about in terms of traditional finance, because there's a leapfrog opportunity here in the developing world for how you do this that, that really... Um, I think back to cell phones being a massive leap. And the U.S. was further behind in adopting those than, than the rest of the world because we had telephone infrastructure right. that, you know, obviously we relied on. It was ubiquitous. And, uh, but when the rest of the world didn't have that, they were able to just jump right ahead uh, with cell technology. And, and so many of the things in the developing world seem to be happening that way uh, without access to, to traditional banks without trusting those banks, without mm -hmm. trusting the governments there. So uh, I think the cross-border space, the remittances space is definitely uh, a very uh, now time period to be thinking about uh, how that should look if, if there are protections that, that uh, you know, banks want to, want to, or things they want to, ex you know, really explore and, mm -hmm. and figure out. Now, now is the time to be doing it in that space. Yeah. I mean, we all know that the remittances rule has been a, a thorn in uh, the side of many financial institutions and, and has made it really, you know, tough for consumers as well to, to make these sorts of um, payments just because it is so cumbersome on the financial institution to comply with that. So uh, an alternative is uh, certainly welcome. And I think uh, something that could make a big difference. I know that um, it's, you know, currently uh, in use for digital assets, cryptocurrency is, is in use in some um, humanitarian efforts across the world. So. Well, that does it for this episode of The Cup. Thank you so much, Kathy, for joining me. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for tuning in to this exciting discussion on blockchain. If you enjoy uh, watching The Cup, please hit the like button, the subscribe button to get notifications for future episodes and leave us a comment on your favorite streaming platform. Let us know what you'd like to hear on a future episode of of the cup. That is it for today. And until next time.